Oh, sorry. Uh, that's Skybringer, man. It gets right into your brain. It sticks there for a minute. Uh, boys and girls, look who we have on a fine Thursday evening. This is Sir in the Pot with Don Kincaid and my very special guest. First time ever, uh, Dashing D. Weatherford. What's up, my man? Hey, hey, hold on, hold on. No longer Weatherford. I am formally known as Weatherford and officially go by the moniker of Dashing D. Thousand now. Whoa, uh, breaking news on Stir in the Pot, I guess. Or uh, has this been for a while? Because I was not aware of that, my friend. It has been for a bit. Um, the name change came um, sometime last year. And it was, I haven't been back to test the strength with the new moniker, so that might be one of the main reasons. Um, but yes, I'm performing completely under Dash and D Thousand, formerly known as Weatherford. Dashing D Thousand. Yes, sir. Got you. I'll make sure I, uh, I don't, I, I, can, I can only remember so much, but I will definitely make a mental note of that. Understood, understood. Uh, well, thank you for coming in. Uh, we appreciate we because th this isn't my show, my friend. This is this is our show, the fans. This is for all of us to learn about the talented men and women that are on the indie scene around us. Uh, some of uh, some of the fans may or may not know you. So what we like to do is introduce you to new fans uh, mm -hmm. and the fans that do know you. We just get to know you a little bit, have some fun, maybe pull the curtain a little bit ba uh, back a little bit. Uh, usually I kind of go off the cuff, but going to be a little something different today. We'll get into that. Uh, so again, thank you for uh, coming in and sitting with us. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me, uh, Don. Uh, known you for a while. You saw the rise of the congregation in Test of Strength. Uh, yeah. You were one of the first fans that I kind of connected with over there. Um, when I just started out uh, going in with uh, Wagner and uh, the seven-way match that we had in. So, yeah, no, a lot of history there. Wow. <laughs> That's a ways back, my friend. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do you, do you remember off the top of your head what training day that is? Uh, off the top of my head, I wouldn't be able to call the number. I definitely was a training day. Um, I remember more the match than I would okay. actually say I remember um, the actual training day title. Uh, you, you know, this is a weird place. I've never started here, but I'm going to because this is being brought up by yourself. Um, mm -hmm. Do you remember more, and obviously uh, you might have or, or already answered my question, but matches stick out more in your memories as you go along in your career than per se an event that happened or maybe a big name that was on the show? More of the matches kind of stick with you and move along? Big, uh, yeah, very much so. Uh, for me, I am definitely one of those guys, you know, the matches are important, the moves that happened, the memories I can make, how effective it was, that stays with me. Um, more than anything else. I'm always looking at the impact, what connection I had with the fans. So each match itself stays with me more than necessarily to say, you know, it was this exact promotion, this exact city, or, I mean, the cities, they, that matters because it's different fan bases and things like that. It all comes together, but the match itself will kind of stick out for me. Uh, because you, you kind of lose sometimes where you're at. You never know. You, oh, yeah. <laughs> I've seen it more than once. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, but I can definitely say there's something special about New England. Um, I definitely know where I'm at, depending on where I'm at it throughout the New England. Massachusetts fans, uh, Rhode Island fans, Connecticut fans. Uh, you guys are definitely a different breed compared to New York fans. Um <laughs> But it's nothing to say that it's one, I prefer one more than the other, but I have a lot of appreciation for each one differently, uh, just on the grounds that you guys are, you're unique in your own ways. Uh, I thank you for those kind words, and I've spoken to that uh, because you're from New York City, my friend, is that correct? That's right, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I've, talk, I've talked on this show to some of the fine talent in your area. And I know you know some familiar faces that have been on Stir in the Pot. And sure we've do. talked about that same exact topic, the differentials between the New York City, <laughs> whoo, uh, the New York City fan base compared to, you know, the Connecticut, Rhode Island and such. And I know it kind of differs just a smidge from one to another, but new NYC, my friend. Uh, and I'm going to speak at the fitness center specifically because that's where I've been a couple times. 
Gotcha. Uh, that place is a nutso. Uh, <laughs> cra- crazy off the hook, off the chain, however you want to say it. The fan base down there, uh, way. L- uh, you know what? I want to say uh, the crowd is larger than life as much as the wrestling is down there because they're very uh, much louder in their own way. Um, mm-hmm. at the music that you, uh, the companies present is a little bit louder than I'm used to. So it's almost like a gigantic party when you walk into the fitness center, you go up to the second floor, you walk down this big old room, and then all of a sudden you open these curtains and it's like this whole new different world, <laughs> this whole different world that's back there. And it's the wrestling uh, setup, which I find is pretty cool, unique and different, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, New York, definitely, you know, big city of dreams. Big, everything about New York is a big production. So, you know, um, you don't have the same intimacy that you do in some of the New England shows and things like that. New York is very much big, big production. How much can you make it pop? How loud it's going to be? Um, and the fan base is very attached to that. They come in, they're just as loud, just as raunches. Uh, They have their own identity that plays a part in the match. You know, New York is one of those special places where it's a great place to be a bad guy and sometimes the hardest place to be a good guy. Um, But, you know, you got to come in there. You definitely got to come in there with some sort of flavor of or swag or they're going to eat you alive, you know, and I've been blessed that I've I've been on the side of both sides of it. And, uh, you know, I love it. I, I definitely love that vibe. But New England itself is definitely a little bit more intimate, definitely a little bit closer. Um, there's a certain subtle level of respect for more of wrestling technique than certain moments in matches um it, it's 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 such a strange thing when you can really pick up on that dynamic but it's an amazing thing because it makes each show worthwhile because of that difference well i appreciate those words because again another topic we've spoken on this uh, because it's always I, I i've never been in the ring so getting so much talent i get to ask uh, some of these questions, but I know they get repetitive, but I get to pick each person's brain, each, each of your fine talent. Um, and some are very different, very, you know, night and day responses. Um, mm-hmm. so staying on that topic, you are taking, uh, you are taking in us, the fans along with your ride when you come out that curtain, because it's not something that's easy to do. Again, we've spoken about this many a times. Um, so you personally, Certainly. um, where do you think on your tenure? Uh, first off, real quick, how long have you been in the game? Uh, it's been on and off. I, I usually just been saying eight years. Um, okay. I started training, started training some a while back in twenty, Jesus, uh, what twenty twelve probably. Okay. Um, and to me, I'm still a trainee. Um, you know, I I have. Uh, I'm very humble in that attack, um, despite my character, despite how I really carry myself. <laughs> I take a lot of pride in everything I do, but I am actually very humbled by the process of what it takes to be a professional wrestler. What it takes to also really just go out there and even call yourself a professional. So I think I don't care whether I'm signed, contract, whatever. I'll still consider myself a student of the game um, until that time comes and when someone says I'm in a Hall of Fame somewhere. So um, that being the case, you know, I I go by how long I've been training, not necessarily how long it's been, you know, performing and such. Because honestly, um, when I started, I went through training and I was kind of performing as a manager almost immediately. Um, okay. within a within a matter of a uh, few months. So, um, which was a good thing because I got to get introduced to wrestling from a manager's perspective and shift further into an actual performer as a in-ring competitor. Uh, very well spoken, my friend. Love everything that you just said because, I, I, again, another topic, there's so many pieces of the puzzle to become a uh, singles wrestler. Never mind, you know, it just has to be... Personally, I've always said it's got to be one of the hardest things in the universe to accomplish because of what it actually takes. Um, so we're talking about eight years. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So we're talking about eight years. Uh, now, reading us, the fans, do you feel 
do you do you remember when there was a point in your career when you actually started connecting where it clicked may it be a match walking out the curtain um and how long did it take because everybody's answer is very different it could be a year it could be a couple months it could be el natural it could be five years they're still trying to mm -hmm. get it um where did you start reading us it uh it took a while it was not it was not very inherent it was not um i started having to learn it um i had to kind of start being able to really get myself in the position to read the room um you know when i first started out a lot of matches were uh, you know we, we a lot of people would call it the spot monkey fest or the very indie pity patter it just goes move 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 get to the next spot get to the next spot um and I started learning more the more I trained, depending on and then working with multiple uh, trainers, uh, highlighting different things based off their cup of tea, what they liked. I got more in depth of what they were saying about different things, about slowing down, uh, mm -hmm. making making the moves count. All of those things started to register. And then for me, I started off as a fan. So starting off as a fan made me start looking for those moments that got me excited. And it was like, well, now how am I going to make that happen for everyone else? So as I as I would get in the ring and I would do certain moves, I started finding myself really trying to listen. Um, and it really became apparent, uh, I want to say it was probably around the time uh, that I started back in Test of Strength during that run within the last two years that I really started understanding it. Um, and it clicked very well with uh -oh. I think he froze the time the time is still running, but I do see Mr. Weatherford oh no nah, mr Mr. thousand d thousand he is frozen. I don't know if he can hear me, but we're just gonna uh see these are the things oh you got me. I it looks All right. like we're sinking back up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were frozen there for a couple seconds there. Yes. Gotcha. All right, cool, cool. Glad we're back. Yes. Um, but there was a match, I, I want to say, like, uh, it happened in Rhode Island. Uh, I definitely could say in Rhode Island. It was a tag team match. It was probably, like, my second one. I had just – I had wrestled a match maybe before, and I actually had a cracked rib um, during the match. And – it was just being able to take part in a match and realizing like how things were going. And I started just kind of going, all right, I need to slow down. Uh, I need to make things matter more. And that's working in that way. I started changing the aspect. And as I did it, I started realizing more of the crowd responses and that's when it really clicked. Um, and from there on, I kind of just move at a different pace that definitely I feel depends on reading the crowd. Uh, you know, I want to create that moment. Um, calling an audible in the ring where it's like, no, let's not do this yet. Let let's do something to give it give it a meaning, give it pop. You know, because that's what we're looking for. You know, whether it's uh, to put the other guy over or to get myself over, one way or the other, we need the fans to connect with at that particular point in time. And as you see with the congregation, that's what we're about. We're really got so serious about connecting with the fans. Um, and more than anything else, that that's the goal. Yeah. Uh, again, very well spoken. Uh, smart wrestling, first off. Like you said, go uh, transitioning, evolving as a wrestler keeping that training going and i know that it's a it's an uh a never ending learning process wrestling is may it be psychology may it be in ring there's always something to learn behind the scenes yes. if you will the yes. business um Certainly. so very well spoken and i and i i appreciate those stages that you've just shared with us because you started off you wanted to do a bunch of stuff people started giving you training here training there and you started soaking that in you started slowing it down letting it breathe once you start doing that and i'm not a wrestler and i'm not going to sit here and, and talk you know talk to the boys and girls like i know but this is what i've gathered from you talented men and women you you let it slow uh slow down a little bit and start breathing and like you said making the moves mean more than what they were before so you're not doing five in one concession you can do one and make it really mean something by connecting with the crowd and getting us involved Exactly. Which said, you know, so I appreciate everything you just said there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but yeah, man, it, it's, it's, you know, wrestling is a beautiful thing. It's one of the greatest 
um, performing arts that it's out there. You know, you're out there, you're telling, uh, you're telling great stories with no words um, through physical action. You're being a character and having to let people know and connect with that character by just moving or just a facial expression. Um, you know, I grew up watching so much wrestling and so many of these characters and, you know, yeah, you start to emulate them so much, you know, um, many people have come up to me and, you know, they can kind of pinpoint some of the people I looked at watching growing up and such like that. Um, even though I think I'm doing something brand new and unique, but you know, there is a callback to it because, you know, I am kind of channeling those things that I grew up with and trying to bring it to life for, you know, in a new way. Um, same old method, um, same process, but trying to just bring my spice to it. And that, okay. that flavor of tea is so far it's working for me. A lot of people seem to dig it. Could you give us the fans a few of those specifics? Who are you uh, taking from maybe uh, paying homage to, but giving your little spin on it uh, from when you were growing up and watching wrestling? What are, who, who are some of the people that you're kind of incorporating? May it be moveset, may it be your swagger down to the ring, may it be how you're acting or such. Uh, give mm. us a few names, please. Um, it's so, you know, there's so many I pull from. Um, Goldust originally was a bigger influence um, just on how he handled uh, kind of being controversial, making the wrestler feel uncomfortable in the middle of a match. Uh, <laughs> Very getting, easy, too. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> getting getting right into a fan's face and then kind of like staring in their eyes a certain way, um, ravishing Rick Rude. Um, you know, I, it, with, with him, you know, the move set, the swagger very much akin to how my character is, uh, especially now, um, over from the evolution, um, Bret Hart is someone I just always loved his technical ability, watched him for years. It was always one of my all time favorites. Um, I get into a bait, a debate often between him and Shawn Michaels, who's better, um, <laughs> and you know, I can go on both, you know, I have honestly have come to the point where I can argue on both sides. But mm -hmm. to me personally, growing up, Brett was always the better of the two yeah. just for his technical ability. Um, but, you know, Shawn Michaels as well, you know, just being very flamboyant, being very out there, having those moments. Um, but more than anyone else, surprisingly enough, Chris Jericho, how timeless he's been, is another mm -hmm. one that has been just a, a great influence on uh, how I see him evolve from so many years in the business. Um, and I've been watching him since he's been the Lionheart in Japan. So it is to see how he's just evolved has been something that kind of stuck with me where I was like coming up with my own gimmick. I was like, well, I can't stick with one thing. Like, I'm always going to have to keep changing. I got to keep it timeless or at least find something that can allow it to redefine, you know, um, Undertaker's another one, um, but not for anything that I pull on as much as the dedication to the gimmick. Um, mm -hmm. Not necessarily, but in the way that he's done it, because there, there'll probably be no one else that can be as dedicated <laughs> as he was, um, nor a gimmick as original as that to where you can get so married to it. But yeah. um, that level of professionalism and the way he thought about psychology and how much he made it mean everything he did, those things are those all the stuff that it, it kind of really piles into to drop names, you know, and I can go on forever and ever about it, but absolutely you know, I don't want to get up the time. <laughs> that's why I always say give us a few because uh, that's what happens when we start chit chat and wrestling and, and the memories. We could just keep going on and on and on because that's what we leave with, sir. And I've talked about this on the show. Um, we the fans leave with these memories of <laughs> We're going to get into, uh, up in Massachusetts, there was a little soiree. Uh, we're going to get into that uh, between you and Mr. Frost at one yeah. point. Uh, yes, sir. And that's something I was there for that I'll always remember. But I took that memory with me as a fan. And I uh, have spoken to you fine talent that you take some of those same memories with you on the ride home. Yes, when sir. you're at home and you start talking to your family about what happened that night at the shows and such. Um, and I think that's actually a beautiful uh, relationship between fan and wrestler that we both split from one event and we're talking about these memories as we go our separate ways 
into our homes. You know what I'm saying? I, th- I just exactly. think it's awesome that we can connect yes. that way. Yes. Um, I going to go a little bit ways back and just kind of comment on um, something that was it stuck with me from this business um and it was just it was given to me by a fellow student um who was more advanced than me uh chris talon um he was one of those guys who sat down and we talked about some stuff with wrestling and he just said you know think of that connection that you had what other sport gives it to you and we just he was like there is no other one and it stuck with me so much and that was one of those things and i was like yeah that's what makes this all the more special um so also Shout out to Talon if he's out there watching. I'm looking for I'm looking to get in the ring with you too sometime to mix it up again. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I want to touch upon the character because that seems something uh, the way you've spoken about who you've taken from uh, dedicating, like you've said, dedicating the time to uh, presenting that character to us, not only for us though, for yourself because this is this is a lot of hard work and effort and time that you've taken to be so creative on getting this character and you want to present it as much as we want to see it. You know what I'm saying? So um, talk talk to us about this character. Well, I mean, Dash and D thousand is the upper echelon, especially now with D thousand D thousand is a thousand levels above the rest. Weatherford was just a man who was born of money rich love the most finest things in life well dash and d is a little bit different he actually is more he lives in that lifestyle he is that lifestyle he personifies it he is royalty you know the biggest basis and influence on the gimmick and character itself was the actual real life artist prince um i drew a lot of inspiration from there um you know there is Others that are drawing inspiration and that that is being seen elsewhere, but everyone has their own interpretation. And my interpretation with it is just being that person who personifies the upper echelon, who actually is, you know, the lover and the fighter. You know, I can cut you down with my words, but I'd much rather cut you down with my fists. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, I'm going to do it in such a way that I'm impressing all the ladies that are out there. And the best part of it is that now I get to be spicy in the <laughs> ring where I'm actually doing it as a good guy. And, you know, now Dash and D thousands also with all of that I am is now in the congregation. So now we're putting this along with what is also something very important to me, my faith and my religion, you know, as a Christian, um, to say that it's not just about me being, you know, grandiose and so much better than everyone. It's actually about being blessed, you know, and how I get to use that and interpret it. And interesting enough, you know, uh, like I said, Prince being a big inspiration. And as you see, um, Rocking a nice print shirt here. I always, whenever you see me, there's purple. Um, I live the gimmick as much as I can. Um, and to give that that honest connection and Prince himself being a Jehovah Witness, all of those things, I look for the connection. How do I keep it realistic enough so that at any point in time, I can snap in or snap out of it if necessary? Or even if I quote unquote snapped out of it and it's everything's a shoot, you still see Dash and D thousand in me as well. So um, I take the character very serious. Um, like I said, I I dare to go out there and do all the things that I do, and that's what makes me dashing the way that I'm dashing. And everyone else, you gotta level up to get there. Especially the thousand. Uh, yes, sir. A little- a little evolution of character, if you will, my friend. Yes. Um, now, obviously, if you're taking from the prince, uh, getting your gear together must have been at least a little bit easier than most because you already got the, the color p- uh, picked out. It's going to be purple. Yes. 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 <laughs> Very much so. Um, and it was easy. Purple was my favorite color. You know, I never had to go with anything else. Um you know, in the congregation, it got uh, interesting for people when they saw me in blue tights. They were like, wait, what's going on? Um, <laughs> Eric, you always had purple. And I was like, yeah, but there's purple still, you know. Um, mm-hmm. 
but you know it's one it's one of those things where you know the color becomes a very defining part of the character but i can be the character in a different color you know you don't always have to just stay in that one specific gear and that's the important part about making your character interchangeable um and that's been something i've i've been blessed well enough to actually been able to pull off and no, uh, uh understand well, i'm sorry no 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 just i was gonna say and understanding that I'm going to use a quick example, if I may, about uh, color, different colored gear. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to use, but it's it's the mask instead of the specific. Well, sometimes it, it, sometimes it is the gear as well. Uh, but the Great Nuka, are you familiar with the Great Nuka? Mm -hmm. My man has got an array of masks uh, and, you know, different attire, you know, because you don't yes. want to look exactly the same and maybe become stale to us, the fans, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so he has an array of masks, but they have different meanings behind them. And that's something that like you're just speaking, you know, even though uh, there's a different look, that doesn't mean that the character is totally changed or whatever. There might be a little, like you say, maybe a little spice on said night or, you know, just a little more aggression than there was when I usually wear purple or something. So you get to play just a little bit with the character by just switching the color of your gear. Exactly. Yes. Um, you know, I always laugh about this um, because I tell people it's important to think about it in this way. Um, you look at wrestlers in their haircuts. You know, sometimes the appearance literally is the changing of that character. Sometimes it's the difference between their face or their heel um, or whether they go from one platform to a main event platform. Um, your mid card or low card, everything can be used as an evolution. It can be very interchangeable. Every time we walk out there, we're telling some sort of a different story. And it's an ongoing story. It's an ongoing journey. And the fans are there and they're paying attention to it. Um, it's why gear becomes so important. You know, there's uh, the wrestler, you know, when they actually come out there in boots versus when they're actually out there in wrestling shoes. That can have a meaning. As something as simple as shaving your beard can have a meaning. It's all the amount of what you really give it. Um, you look at, uh, I think back to, specifically, I want to be more recent, though. Uh, we look at the evolution of Patrick Clark to Velveteen Dream. Um, we look at Triple H with long hair and the handlebars when he looks more like a motorhead character to Triple H now with the shaved CEO cut and heavier beard. You know, these were different characters and very defined in who they were at that point based even just with the appearance. CM Punk versus entering um, with long hair, kind of clean shaven, and then when he evolved into the champion with short hair. Mm -hmm. They meant something. They were evolutions of that character. Um, yep. so, you know, it, it's very important. Even Rey Mysterio, like you said, in di his different masks, multiple things. Um, but it's, sometimes it's subtle, sometimes it's bigger, but it's as important because the fans realize that, you know, um, my personal favorite was The Rock, um, and his evolution. Um, and but I mean, as The Rock versus Hollywood Rock. Uh, Rock when he slimmed down and then Rock when he went to Hollywood got completely jacked up and then came back and it's like, <laughs> oh God, he's such a monster now. You know, <laughs> those things they come with they come with the territory. Drew McIntyre from before to now. Uh -oh. Two different beasts. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's important. It's important, you know. Um and I take that seriously. You know, the day you Uh oh. I th I, I think Mr. I think Mr. Thousand D Thousand froze up on us again. Counter's still going. Runtime's still kicking. Okay, good, 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 good. There we go. Thought I lost you for a second. All right. That's okay. <laughs> awesome. So yeah, you know, like I said, the the day you see me in some actual wrestling trunks, more so, that's going to be an evolution. That's that's something different if it goes there. Will it go there? We don't know. But you know, that's something to say. That can be a change in that ch when it, if it does go there, I'll make sure it's a significant change that the fans will be able to understand. And, and, and we totally get these little not maybe not all of them, 
But uh, the fans, we usually get most of these little nuances when we see you men and women on a regular basis. So when you come out with a little something different, may it be just a look in your face. May it be you're carrying, you know, the cane versus to where mm-hmm. you weren't. Um, a hat, throwing around the money, um, stuff like that, these little things. Uh, we see these things, and, and, and I've always appreciated that because, like I said before, it doesn't stay the same. It doesn't stay the same, so it doesn't get stale, and it stays fresh for both of us, the fans and yourselves as a character. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, I mean, uh, perfect example, I love my money gun. Um, but it doesn't <laughs> fit every scenario, um, you know. But the last time that the money gun was probably used was um, – for championship win, um, when I was in Rhode Island under Ome- with Omega Black, and I stand on the guy and I shower myself in money and gold. You know, <laughs> it was there to create that one big moment and get that great picture, that great um, memory for myself and someone else. Um, has it been used really since? Does that mean it's not going to be? We'll see. You know, everything depends on the scenario, the story. Like right now, there's an upcoming match, um, January 22nd in Jersey, SWF. It's going to be the Congregation versus the Zoltan. Now, wow. the Zoltan has great history with the Congregation that goes behind the scenes. I know the Zoltan very well because the Zoltan were part of the wrestling school I went to, and they were the veterans when I was coming in as a rookie. Um, in fact, Whiplash was one of the guys that spent time with me and I was directly under his tutelage. So the history runs deep and this is a match that's going to be very defining because it's a little bit personal. Um, it's personal in the sense that this is a litmus test for me. Um, I need to prove that I can go in there and I can bang with these guys because these were the guys that took me under their wing a bit and showed me a lot of the ropes that... I've come to use today to make myself my own character. I need to hold my own against them. So knowing what they do, knowing how well the Zoltan is, then just what that name does, I'm coming in much more aggressive. This is going to be Dashing D Thousand in a way you have not seen him. This is this is going to be me thinking more in a main event spot kind of a deal. You know, I want to go in. I want to hit hard. I want to hit fast. Um, all the praise and blessings that are there that are going to be given to God are going to be given. But this victory is also going to have a little piece of me in there where, you know what, maybe I'll kick a little harder. Maybe I'll punch a little bit more directly for the face. But this, <laughs> this has that meaning and calling that this, has, this is going to be an evolution. Mm-hmm. This match itself will make an evolution. Uh, and for, for the boys and girls that don't know, who either the congregation, Omega Black, uh, Zoltan, look them up on the face page. It'll get you right to them. Uh, you can't miss Zoltan. They got the, the Z going. Uh, and the congregation, you can't miss uh, purple, blue, gold, beautiful everywhere. Uh, and Omega Black, that Greg Jones, man, he spooks me sometimes. I got to admit, he does. He does kind of, I got to watch him sometimes. He's a slick character. He definitely was a slick character. I mean, my time with him, we wind up getting tagged gold in Rhode Island and MAW. Um, we used some dirty tactics. You know, we had we went in there. Greg Jones is a great mind in wrestling um, for the fact that he knows who he is and he knows what he has to do and he knows how to win. Um, he goes the extra mile to actually make sure he gets there, but he's not going to go and fight you pound for pound. He's going to try to outsmart you. Um, and he'll use some, he'll use whatever tactic he can to do it. So you got to be prepared for that. Um, our last outing, you know, we wind up on different sides of the fence. There is not an Omega Black that involves Dash and D anymore. Um, and there should be a match that comes about between me and Greg Jones that Ooh. should settle that. Um, wow. And for those okay. who were part of the MAW crowd and fan base, they know exactly what happened. And I invite others to go and look at some of the matches there to see what that story was. Because as far as I'm concerned, um, if we ever wind up squaring up, that that's going to be part of the memories and the story that gets told in that match. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, for the boys and girls that don't know, 
MAW is man, uh, Mass Anarchy Wrestling out of the Chop Shop. Uh, MAW kind of went down. They had a, a little. They had a good run there. There's plenty to look at. If you look them up on Face Page and stuff, you can check them out over there and follow the links to go see their footage and whatnot. Uh, what was cool about on their Facebook was they had all of the champions, all of the roster in one little section where the photos were. They gave you the entire roster. And if people interchange, they added those people. They didn't like let it sit there, be stale with all of the old talent and stuff or whatever. They kind of brought in and did their thing. Um, that has changed over to something else, different owners and such. And uh, obviously the Chop Shop uh, 2, I want to just clarify that. Um, the building, they, they had to kind of, something's up with the building. So the wrestling had to kind of move on. Uh, mm -hmm. We, the fans, and I know you guys, uh, you guys and girls are waiting to see what happens with all of that because there were so many promotions under uh, one umbrella yes. uh, over there. So, uh, but while we're on the topic, just as recently as of either this morning or yesterday, and I, because I can't remember a whole lot, my friend, um, RICW, if you, I, I know you're familiar with RICW over there from the Chop Shop, correct? Oh, he froze again. What do we got going on? Here we oh, go. There here we go. There, there, there here we go. All right. Here we go. <laughs> uh, RICW is coming back, my friend. They made a little announcement. And I know you're familiar with RICW, correct? Ah, Sons of Biscuit. Because I'm going to drag. All right. Are we back? We're back. We're back. We're we're back. Okay. Now I was going to say I'm going to do use some of these tech savvy ideas that I have and find a way to make this work. <laughs> Thank you. Because, hey, we don't want to kill it. We just want to keep going. Uh, I'll exactly. filibuster. Whatever I got to do to keep this train rolling, my friend. Uh, Indeed. RICW, Rhode Island Championship Wrestling, made an announcement that they're going to be coming back. Did you happen to see that, my friend? I did. I did. Um, I believe it was something that was announced a little earlier today, if not earlier in the week. Um, and it, it it caught my eye. It caught my attention. You know, the pandemic has made wrestling very difficult. Um, trying to get out there, follow into any type of setting is just been difficult. Um, you want to social distance. You're still trying to keep everyone safe. Wrestling is not one of the best forms of entertainment that you can do and probably social distance. So there's so many risks that are involved for us to just entertain. Um, right. And, you know, let's face it, you know, for some of us, this is our only form of income. Um, so for that too, you know, this is a job that we get out there and do, and, you know, we risk our lives more than one way to actually make that happen. So hearing more promotions willing to run and things, you know, at this, it's waves of good hope. And it catches anyone's attention right away because a lot of us are just we're starving for opportunities. Um, you know, some of us just want to get in the ring just to get in the ring. Some of us want to get back in the ring because we just we got to put money in our pockets, you know, mm -hmm. one way or the other. I, absolutely. Um, I do have something that I normally don't do. And, and we're going to go read some uh, chatter that was on when I posted that uh, Dashing D. And I know it says Weatherford on my page, but I. I and now it's dashing D thousand. That's uh, right. When I put up the picture, stirring the pot tonight, there was a little bit of chatter on there, and I know you were part of some of that. So we're gonna go to that. But before we do, mm -hmm. I know you more in the congregation than I do Omega Black. Could you please, because I've been dying to talk to you about this, <laughs> please talk to us about your connection with Brother Greatness. There's a sister Kiki in the mix. I know we've met her only one time, maybe twice at Test mm -hmm. Strength, maybe twice. Talk to us how you got connected with the congregation, my friend. So the congregation was a little bit of an evolution from Omega Black. Omega Black was uh, the first faction that I ran with. Um, it dates back to here in New York. Um, they, we were formed. We all were training together. Uh, it involved um, Osiris, um, Greg Jones, myself, 
um, and Brother Greatness, um, along with uh, an individual known also as Malice Oceans. We were the original incarnation of Omega Black um, oh, wow. under the promotion of Fighting Spirit Wrestling. Um, over time, you know, wrestlers, you know, that we move around, we go different places. So Omega Black saw a lot of reincarnations in different faces. Um, there was a version with um, Eric and Ian Gordon, um, and they were part of Omega Black. Um, really? The Gordon brothers, they were at wow. one point. There was okay. also an incarnation that involved a gentleman by the name of Suntan, also known as Suntan Superman, who's more familiar on the New York. Man, I know he'll be back. I know he'll be back because we're having such a great conversation. I just heard Suntan. I've seen him perform one time. We're going to get... Oh, he's back. Gotcha. All right, yes. we're here? We're here? Yes, okay. we are here. You, you were talking <laughs> Mr. Suntan. I've only seen him perform one time, and wow. Yeah. Big, big guy, cowboy hat, white towel, black boots, black gear does moon salts like Vader. <laughs> um, it, it was, it, he was a great guy. Ah, bugger. That's all right. We're going to, we're going to keep it rolling. I know he's going to be back. My friends. I know he's got this, uh, talking to dashing D I'm learning so much because I knew nothing about some of the stuff that he's talking about. Uh, the original Omega black who knew? Oh, Hey, I think he's back. You got me? You got me? Yeah, uh, we, we got you, my friend. Okay. Because uh, if this happens one more time, I'm going to say just stay on. But what I'm going to do is I will set up to switch my internet connections um, because I'm in a place that has multiple and sometimes they interfere. So I'll go to okay. a more secure one that should uh, alleviate some of the problems, at least on my end. If there's something else going on, <laughs> I won't be able to help that. But uh, God's grace will get through it one way or the other. But yes, uh, Omega. Oh, bugger. <laughs> well, my friends, maybe he's doing a little switcheroo of the Wi-Fi. We're going to see where this goes. We're just going to hang tight. Uh, wait. Nope. Nope. Not yet. Ah. Oh. I thought we had him. He may be switching, though. But we are having a fine conversation, uh, learning. Because, again, that's what this is all about, is learning about the things that we didn't know about the said talent. I didn't know all of that stuff about Omega Black. And we just learned a lot of that uh, all together. So that was pretty cool. Um, so, I, you know, I did speak to Kylon King, Flash Waller, and The Haven being Sean Knight. And Jay Onyx, a couple of days ago, this happened with Kylon King. I kind of poked fun at him that he was using the McDonald's free Wi-Fi. Uh, but I know, that, <laughs> I know that Dashing D is not doing that. Uh, so hopefully we get that connection right back. Because there's, I, I'm definitely. Aha, uh -huh. we are back. Uh, the technical difficulties, uh, we are surpass those we'll see how <laughs> how we roll now uh we were yes. on the uh omega black to uh the 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 many forms of when we got to mr suntan yes uh like i said each person had their own dynamic each individual gave uh, omega black a different level of a personality uh suntan almost made us like very weird vengeful uh, black cowboys uh, <laughs> the, uh at one we originally started as a fraternity um, by the end of it, we were um, just some hungry sports dudes that were believed in the finer things in life and did whatever it takes to win. Um, but also, eventually, it went back to the original setup uh, with myself, um, Greg Jones, Osiris, and Brother Greatness. And that's when we wind up in Rhode Island and MAW. Um, though I don't think everyone got to really realize how much Osiris was involved in that promotion. Um, but eventually it, it came to light um, for those who were really paying attention well enough behind the scenes. Um, but at this rate, Omega Black is kind of like a little bit of a family. You know, we're kind of like the clique at this rate. Um, we break apart. We come together. It really just depends on how things are going. As of right now, like I said, 
I'm not necessarily involved with it. Brother Greatness is also not involved with it. But there is always a need for tag teams. And tag teams being so important, Brother Greatness and myself found ourselves wanting to fill that void. So the first introduction of the congregation came in a tag team tournament. We had a test of strength. Um, and myself and Greatness said, you know what, if we're going to give this tag team thing a run, there's no better place for us to really go after it than a tag team tournament for a promotion that's introducing new titles. Um, and we got ourselves together, and what you guys were seeing was the evolution of I thought I thought we were no, I thought we were past the free the, the freezing of the Wi-Fi. Oh yeah, I'm starting to feel like we're on a versus channel here. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't know which character. I I feel like I'm one of the early characters. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I don't. I, I'm in a brownstone, brick walls. Connections don't always go too well, so that might be part of it. Um, That's quite all right. We're 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 fighting through this. Don't even sweat it, my friend. Gotcha. So uh, yeah, just a uh, push. Pushing straight through. Uh, congregation, we were born out of the necessity of wanting to fill a void for tag teams. Um, what a lot of you got to see in Tessa Strength was us growing up. Bugger! <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is stutter stepping. All right. While I got you, very quickly. You guys watch the tag team of the congregation grow in every match. We were not training on the side together. We were not doing much together. We were learning and gelling as a tag team more and more every match. Oh, so wow. that was us literally evolving before your eyes. Um, when we first started, uh, yes, we did have Kiki. Kiki was part of the congregation, but Kiki wanted to also focus more on not necessarily working in management as much as becoming her own rising star in the wrestling business. So to do that, she took a back seat and the congregation just kept on pedaling along. Um, over time, as you see, congregation is much more of a well-oiled machine than we were in the beginning. But like I said, it was every single match that you saw us, we were growing into what we became today. So thank you guys for believing in us and connecting with us like you did, because you are as much the reason for that success as any other part of the training that we did. Um, so wow. thank you. Thank you, fans. Uh, learning that. Uh, we got to see that raw in front of our eyes it is just absolutely amazing. And I am so glad that we were both being able to connect with each other because you guys were giving it to us. And as, as soon as you come through, you know, there's curtains, there's doorways, whatever, whatever uh, position you're in, you come through and you give us this, you got this thing going, the music and, and your energy there is no way that we are not going to give it back to you, my friend. So uh, thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate you uh, with the kind words to us, but what, if you don't do that, we don't know how to read you men and women. And uh, I, I, you know, thank you for the signals of we're here to have fun, but we're going to kick some butt in that ring too. So get ready. Uh, you know, you guys have always put those signals right out of, we are here to have a blast and brother greatness. When he's in the ring and he does his thing, you know, the alleluia and, and whatnot and his little, oh, my goodness, brother, uh, brother, great. Yes. just tickles me so much. <laughs> he's an amazing talent when it comes to connection. Um, and what I love about him, a lot of that is him. You know, mm -hmm. that's that's who he is as a person. Uh, you're going to connect if you have the pleasure to work with him or sit around him one-on-one -on -one, you'll connect with that energy right away whether it's in the ring or like i said just having that sit down conversation you'll get that right away from him um and it's an amazing thing to do and um like i said i've been up and down the road with this guy so much you know that is definitely uh, my little brother so you know i want to take this as far as we can go with it and we're glad that as much as we're having fun with it we're glad you guys are having fun with it with us uh, absolutely Absolutely. And I cannot wait uh, to see uh, what happens with the congregation in the future because you guys are fantastic. We had tons of fun with you. And I just can't wait to see what's uh, for the future 
of the congregation. Now, for the tail end of this, I'm going to switch it up a little bit. I normally don't do this. I've only done it with a couple um, of the guests, but I've kind of used, utilized the whole show with, with this uh, material, if you will. Mm -hmm. Well, again, we were talking about the chatter on the face page, and I kind of want to go to that uh, because some of it I cannot wait to ask. Um, <laughs> uh, now, it, it starts off, uh, if you didn't notice, I am wearing one filthy Dirtologist Dirtbag Dan t-shirt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I figured I, I figured A lot of history I there. A lot of history there. That's why I wore it. I figured I, I that would be a, a little... Maybe a little connection for this interview. So I'm going to start right off because he's the first one that commented and got this thing going. So let's let's kick it off with Dirtbag Dan. Uh, don't forget to mention how he can't win a polk war with me. That uh, still... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, look, Dirtbag Dan is definitely the filthologist, uh, the dirtologist. Um, <laughs> But you know what? Dirtbag Dan uh, behind the scenes is an amazing individual. That is uh, a, a, someone in this business that I would even go as far as to call a friend, someone that I like connecting and talking with. Um, we're not that close to where I can definitely say, you know, I know everything about him or whatever or whatnot. But, you know, we're close enough that, you know, we get into some hijinks behind the scenes. Um <laughs> Dirtbag Dan was one of the first opponents for the congregation. He was a test run, um, and I think the Filthy family and the congregation, we grew from every match that we had with one another, um, and that's what set a lot of things in motion for us to do what we did um, between then and now. Um, and with that, there was a poke war using the Facebook functions of poking in which he claims he was the most amazing poke master ever and i stepped up to the challenge because i don't back down from anything again i'm, I'm dashing <laughs> d i'm the i'm the upper echelon I, i'm the i'm the high bar here um and me and him we went back and forth with this poke war and he was relentless you know i don't know how the guy works and does anything in his life and still manages to hit that poke button so much he did but i was dedicated to win so i started getting at it too problem is though <laughs> I think Facebook, you know, and I, I don't I don't want to sound like our outgoing president and start talking about fake news or anything. I don't want to be political about it. But, you know, I feel like there was a point where Facebook itself was helping him. There were moments where I would put a poke and it would go unanswered. I would see no notification. I would see nothing. And I was thinking, you know what? For two months, I have left myself unpoked after poking dirt bag Dan. <laughs> and he would go, no, I poked you. And I would go, no, I have no notification. And it would be a post and a post and a whole thing. And he would say, no. And the next thing I know, soon I refresh and refresh. And two days later, there's a poke. And then there's a picture with him on his system screenshotting that he poked me 14 days ago. And I'm like, <laughs> I never saw the poke. So it's controversial. <laughs> it's controversial. But I wind up conceding. Because it happened to me two times, and I just didn't feel like arguing anymore. And he prides himself as the poke master out here. So, <laughs> Dirtbag Dan, for all argument's sake, even though it's with an asterisk, Ooh. you successfully outpoked Dash and D Weatherfoot. But I'm still your girlfriend's favorite wrestler. Uh, wow. <laughs> uh, wow. And... Um... I didn't mean to trigger you, my man. That, that seemed to bring a little bit of heat. <laughs> oh, there's there's no heat. This is all just in good fun. But I'm a I'm a competitor at heart, one way or the other. I'm always going to be competitive, and I'm and I'm slightly bothered that I I I thought I was winning. I believed I was winning. I had proof. I posted it, and then he was able to have counter proof. And I can't say what's solicited as truth or not. <laughs> Uh, Z Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg pulled the wool over your eyes. My it feels like it. It feels like it. You know, I don't know if he's got anything in for me, but you know, you're, there's probably a hit list. I've had some dastardly deeds in the past, and that probably can loop into your next question. <laughs> uh, be because you've been in, you, again, you've been part of this, so you do know exactly what's coming. And I've been uh, that first question. I've really been waiting to hit, but this one, my friend, uh, I cannot wait because. There's a specific word that this uh, this specific person uses. He loves you, the word bum. Uh, loves calling everybody 
a bum, and I it tickles me as a fan. I think it's absolutely amazing. Um, but I'm going to read from one Ryan Frost. Make sure he knows he's a bum, a well-dressed bum with good taste in music, but a bum, period. You know, Ryan Frost, I think, sometimes is trying to go for the gimmick of Mickey from Rocky. You know, just by using the word bum and throwing it out there. Look, it's a gimmick that's been used in movies. I understand you're drawing from the inference, but you got to come harder than that, Frost. All right? You know, look, look, look. You're out there, the everyday working man, hard guy champion. Um, but, yeah, yeah, you're going to have to deliver a little bit more something with some umph and some sting. Because, again, when it came to us one-on-one, -on -one, I got that win on you, buddy. I got that win. So I'm, if I'm, I'm a gonna, bum, what does that make you, Foss? What does it make I'm, you, baby? Yeah. You know, you got cold cash, but you can't toss no money around like Dash and D did, did you? Uh, that brings me to the bottom of this thread that's going on because there was a lot of chatter on this one specific thread uh, with that. Uh, but I'm going to go down and then I'm going to come back up. Uh, Dashing D, you, yourself commented that one time I sought to seek some quick opportunity at gold i already put frost to sleep though in massachusetts uh we're speaking we were at a gcw agawam if i'm not mistaken it was a one-time show they haven't come back there's a couple of companies that were waiting to come back um this was a one-off this just kind of happened out of nowhere if i'm not mistaken is that correct sir that wasn't even on the card um it wasn't on the card um no but uh I like to say it happened, you know, GCW, Massachusetts, um, there was definitely a first time outing for me as well. And, you know, I came in to make a name for myself. I, I let the people know I'm in the human climax and I wanted to give them something to be entertained with. Um, Foss was there. He was in the crowd, a willing, known wrestler um, with an established gimmick in the area. And, you know, I issued an open challenge and he answered. What wind up happening? Yeah, I'll give him credit. He started putting the tar to me. He put he, he made he made it so that I had to put the effort in. But you know, when I say I'm the human climax, that means I know how to turn it up a dial when it's time when it's time to go. I can take it all the way to the top. And the thing is, as much as he beat me, all he did was fuel the fire. And when I came alive and got all the way where I needed to go, and I started getting into my groove and I fought back, he couldn't keep up. And when he found his clutches, he was just another pin on the dashboard. Now, I give him credit. After that time, he went on to win gold and had a 24-7 champion, uh, championship hardcore title he had to defend. Mm -hmm. And at a test of strength, I tried to – I saw an opportunity. I thought I can just sneak up, get the quick rollout, run out <laughs> with a championship. He proved to be a little tougher than the rollout, um, but I wasn't prepared for him to have goons. So – of course, you know, numbers game, got the advantage. Look, Dash and D is a lot of things. As much as I may be a thousand levels above the rest, I am still one man. You put me against several characters, hey, I may not come out as on top. But again, I left walking. I was smiling the next day. So You, you did. You, you did, my friend. And that brings me back up to this thread. Uh, there's one Jake Olette. We like to call him Jake Olay. Uh, he hates mm -hmm. it, and we love it. Uh, <laughs> so Jake Olay says, uh, mention that Frost also had TJ and Samson beat him up at TOS, uh, Test of Strength. That one time, Ref Bill Thompson, uh, pfft, Ref Bill uh, <laughs> hit I hard. Uh, I, I used to. Things have changed between me and Bill. He hits mm -hmm. me with stuff. Chairs, kendo sticks. He kicks me in my shin all the time. Oh. Uh, our relationship has changed. Yeah, it's it's not nice no more. Jesus. Uh, Ref Bill, yeah, yeah. I have to talk with him. Yeah, yeah. please, my friend, put in a good word for me. Uh, but yeah. to finish, uh, Jake Olay, uh, Ref Bill hit so hard that he hurt his hand. <laughs> Woo. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, Bill needed to get that count because uh, he was the referee I found that was trying to seize this opportunity with, with the 24-7 championship. And, uh, yeah, you know. Jake Olette, or you know what? As now that you have said it, 
Ole, Jake, or Jake Ole, you know, matter of fact, we'll just Perfect. call him Ole, you know, just because of, of the Ole? fact that that's what I want him to be known. You are Ole, maybe oil of Ole, <laughs> for good measure. Um, he was one of the cronies to be there and back up Foss to protect him with a title. Now, again, I don't understand how a guy is walking around with a hardcore title 24-7 and yet he's giving no opportunities to his cronies, but they're there to protect him with a title. All that tells me is that, you know what? Maybe, Foss, you knew the only way to keep that title was to have hired guns. Because on your own, you wouldn't have held it. When I had my tag team titles, it was a tag team title. It was two men, but only those two men kept those titles around our waist until we couldn't no more. And even when we lost... There was a hand in it that probably, you know, we can say was only because of the controversy around the laws. But it was us, us two. When it's me and it's one on one, it's me, one on one. Foss had a whole faction, and I still tried to seize the opportunity. So that tells me I got more guts than he does, too. And you know what, Jake? You're still just Ole of oh. just following along. So like I said, I guess there's a nice thing with that douchebag gimmick outfit that you have. Let's retrain, retool that, and get you more into a person for yourself. Wow. Uh, that escalated. And may uh, God be with him. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, that escalated a little bit. Uh, I'm going to move forward. Uh, this is going to uh, bring us to the tail end of this little chatter here. But I know you're going to be interested in this one. And I know there's I, – I see you made a couple comments, so – <clears throat> we have one anti here, Chaz Marinelli. I know you're familiar with him, correct, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Sir. Out of, yes sir. Out of RICW, I've had him on the show a couple times. Uh, this is what he states I didn't forget how he raked my eyes, gave my partner the D, uh, I'd like to touch upon that, and stole a title win over in Mass Army, uh, Mass. Anarchy Wrestling, hashtag the brand. Okay, first off, before you get into that, uh, you gave who the D. What are we talking? All right, so, you know, um, if you become more familiar with my new move set, I have a particular uh, setup with my double knees that has been now dubbed the D, um, oh. mostly because I yell to everyone, as you see. One of my catchphrases is they all want the D. But I everyone knows not everyone can take the D. And as you remember in that match, before I before I always run and throw the double knees, I let people know they can't take the D because you're getting a double dose of some of it right there. And um, I'm the D, and you can't handle what I'm bringing to you. So, yeah, wow. that's the D, and that's what he was served with properly. <laughs> you, you rake the eyes? All right, so, again, Omega Black... Dash and D Weatherfoot. This this was a different time, you know. Oh, okay. I was not always a very cut and dry, straight and narrow kind of wrestler. Um, like I said, Omega Black, we were crafty individuals. We were doing whatever it took to win, and the brand. We knew who we were going against coming in here. You know, we had issued an open challenge. We had dominated Mass Anarchy Wrestling. We knew IRC. Um, RICW was known to be in a chop shop too. They had another level of presence. They they had uh, at the time an extra caliber of talent, and the brand was coming in as former world champions for ICW, and they were coming back to MAW as just to kind of sh see if they can test. What we were bringing, and we were not going to just let Mass Anarchy be disrespected. We were not okay. going to show that, oh, RICW is just better than us. No, we are the tag champions. You're going to have to beat us. And we just were hungrier that day. Um, and in being hungrier that day, I used some more deplorable tactics to just ensure we walked out with that title win. Um, I'm not as proud of it looking back, but... I can say I've changed. I can apologize to Chaz. Um, oh, wow. I can apologize to the brand for my ways, but I will not apologize for doing what it took to win because I did not like 
and was not proud of what I did, but I was happy to show that sometimes you always have to be prepared to win a match by doing what it takes. And in all fairness for competition, they, if they were more prepared, they would have stopped us anyway, you know? True. But, know. but Very true. not something I should have done, you know, raking the eyes, you know, using some things, uh, tactics, misdirection with the ref. We're playing with the rules a little bit, not supposed to bend and break them like that. I will try not to have that as part of me. And with God working more with me in the congregation, hopefully those days are behind me. Oh, oh, okay. All right. F fair enough. Uh, thank you for sharing that with us uh, and with, with Mr. Marinelli because it goes just one step further, if I may. Uh, Mr. Chaz Marinelli says, we'll see. Uh, because you said, uh, let, yeah, let me get back to that. You said, I was a different man then. He reiterates with, uh, responds with, we'll see one day our paths will cross again. One day. You respond with, we shall, and you will see that was Weatherford. I'm dashing the thousand now. Uh, so what this right here is saying that in the near, you never know where in the future. But in the future, one anti-hero and one dashing D-1000 uh, might kind of lock horns, if you will. Yes. Yes, most certainly. Um, you know, this is a revolving door of talent. Um, you know, we are wrestling throughout the Northeast New York tri-state area. Um, you meet a lot of different talent in many different ways. Um there is always a see you later down the road kind of a deal after you've even worked with a guy. And, you know, especially when you work with someone that there was some good chemistry, you want to do it again. Um, and to say that, you know, Chaz, I, um, the brand themselves, uh, even though it was Omega Black, I would love to see how they fare against the congregation. Um, and the thing is, with time, iron sharpens iron. I am no longer the same wrestler I was back then that I am now. I have gotten better. I've gotten stronger. I've gotten smarter. Um, I'm actually even bigger than I was then. Um, so with that, I would just say, you know, I hope Chaz is improving as much as I am. And I would love to see how it is when we lock horns. Maybe it can be a great main event match, or maybe it's one of those matches that they steal the show. But I'm always looking forward to new competition, maybe some old competition to just bring new life into something else. But again, that performance is there to give the fans something. So if we're improving and we're getting better and getting stronger, guess what? That means we're giving you a much better show and some better memories. And that's what I'm looking to do. Uh, everything that you've told us, uh, stories, uh, the evolution of your character, uh, Omega Black, uh, we've talked congregation, uh, we got to some stuff, some chatter on the face page. My friend, this has been, it's probably been a little bit over an hour because we've been running about 25 minutes now, and I think we're around 40, 45 on the last, uh, we're going to get them all together. This has mm -hmm. been a fantastic sitting with one dashing D thousand. And I, I cannot thank you enough for being open candor and talking to us and getting to know you because I didn't know a whole lot about you. I just seen you at the shows. We would talk now and then, you know, yeah. making that connection outside the ring. Uh, but this has been personally, I'm going to be selfish. This has been awesome for me. And I thank you so much, my friend. Oh, you're welcome. You're more than welcome. Um, I like, one thing that I've, I can say that I've enjoyed about this pandemic, it's giving new platforms and new ways to interact with the fan bases, um, giving them a little bit of a peek behind the veil, able to be more personable than just seeing us on shows and things like that. Um, as much as I love to get back to the crowds and just performing, but I like, I like the fans to sometimes get that peek in, get that one-on-one -on -one because, you know, Sometimes that's that becomes a little deeper of a connection. Um, you know, there are fans out there that have questions and sometimes getting just the right amount of things to see a little bit more of themselves in us is what you guys are looking for. You know, it, when you can relate to someone, it makes it a little bit more believable. It makes it a little easier for you to root for them. You know, if I'm just this figure 
that's uh, there's, you know, there's not so much to always care about. Um, so one thing about the pandemic, being able to do these type of interviews or one-on-ones, videos and things like that, I've been able to give more to the fans in that way. And I think we've all connected a little bit deeper with that. And I'm, I'm just happy to bring that about um, and be a part of it. And uh, thank you guys for watching. And uh, thank uh, you specifically, Kincaid, for inviting me on the show. Oh, I, I, absolutely, my friend. Uh, before I do let you go, and I, the kind words uh, to us, the fans, I, I, I love all of them. Very, very well spoken. Uh, before I do let you go, where do we find you, my friend? YouTube, uh, Insta, could you give us some uh, avenues to find you? Yes, yes, um, definitely. Uh, one of the best and easiest ways to connect with me is on Dashing Hazard on Instagram. That is the exact handle, Dashing, under, I believe it's Dashing underscore handle. I mean, Dashing underscore Hazard. <laughs> <laughs> that is the exact handle. Um, but if you do just search in Instagram, Dashing Hazard, it'll take you straight there. Um, there is a YouTube of Dashing um Dash and D wrestles. You can go through it that way. Um, and you can also find um, multiple links. Um, there's Facebook where you can just look under the actual profile page for Dash and D thousand, formerly known as Weatherfoot, or you can actually find a more pseudo Dash and D Weatherfoot because that still exists. I wanted to maintain that connection. So if you find me on Facebook there, you can still be directed to Dash and D thousand. Um, I keep a lot of them very close knitted. They're interchangeable. What I post on Instagram a lot of times winds up on Facebook. I'm more active on Instagram. So there's more of that knowledge. And then, you know, if you want merch, I have pro wrestling tees.com slash dash and D thousand. Um, there's also teespring.com dash in dash D dash D thousand. Um, <laughs> that we have as well for different levels of merchandise. Um, you know, I, I'm a very private person on my shoot life. Um, but as a performer, I do like being accessible for the fans. Um, there are fans that can tell you, um, you know, some have hit me on messenger, just had random talks. Some have sent me a, a, a direct message on Instagram and, I've responded, you know, I don't mind doing it. Uh, I do like respecting certain levels of boundaries. So mm -hmm. there is that. I will ask that that is respected all the time. Um, right. But I do not mind having small conversations with fans and interacting. Um, I love it. It's why we do this business. So by all means, yeah, come on, follow, see what's going on. Catch me at the <laughs> next show. Um, you know, one of the things I like to do, you know, look out. I toss those roses in the crowd. Maybe you could go... That's why I'm your girlfriend's favorite wrestler. I give out roses. <laughs> but you know what? Maybe you want to be selfish and grab that for yourself just to have a little bit of that extra connection. So go for it. <laughs> hey, uh, whatever floats your boat, my friend. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> well, this is Stir in the Pot with Don Kincaid. And my very special guest, we had an amazing hour plus with our friend Dashing D Thousand. Thank you, my friend, for spending the time. Thank you as well, Kincaid. And by everybody, continue to stir the pot with Don Kincaid.